Hello, and thank you for joining the National Keratoconus Foundation and our doctors from the Southern California College of Optometry for our series for students on keratoconus and specialty contact lenses. We've launched this series to celebrate National Keratoconus Day and expand the education of optometry students who have a special interest in managing keratoconus. The National Keratoconus Foundation was founded by families affected by keratoconus in 1986 and is the oldest and largest organization dedicated solely to keratoconus. Since 2016, the foundation has been located in Irvine, California. The mission of the foundation is to provide information and advocacy for individuals with keratoconus by sending free educational materials, answering inquiries, and providing newsletters and webinars. The foundation also hosts roundtable discussions at professional meetings like the Academy of Optometry and ARVO for researchers and clinicians. Students are always welcome to participate. The National Keratoconus Foundation launched World Keratoconus Day five years ago and is now celebrated inter and it is now celebrated internationally by those who are affected by keratoconus. All students who view these lectures and sign up for the National Keratoconus Foundation news newsletter in November will receive a gift from the National Keratoconus Foundation. I'm Erin Roof. Chief of the Cornea and Contact Lens Services at SCCO at Marshall B. Ketchum University, and I'll be your moderator for the series. Throughout these lectures, our SCCO doctors will discuss various topics related to keratoconus diagnosis, management, and contact lens fitting. The Cornea and Contact Lens faculty at SCCO are all residency trained experts in fitting irregular corneas and managing anterior segment disease of all kinds. On top of patient care, our faculty teach students in all things cornea and contact lenses and are involved in research and education of optometry residents and clinicians at all levels. I'm proud to introduce our doctors who are uniquely qualified to talk to you about these topics. Dr. Catherine Zhang received her doctor of optometry degree from SCCO and then completed a cornea and contact lens residency at the University of Houston. She's currently an assistant professor at SCCO. Dr. Elaine Chin received her doctor of optometry degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and completed her postdoctoral residency in cornea and contact lenses at SCCO. She's currently an assistant professor at SCCO as well. So without further ado, here are Drs. Chen and Zhang. All right, thank you, Dr. Ru, for that very kind introduction. I know you can't see me, but this is Dr. Elaine Chin, and we're gonna get us started. We're today talking about scleral contact lenses as indicated for patients with keratoconus. So as you may know already, one of the great benefits of scleral lenses is its customization ability. Similar to a corneal gas permanent lens, uh, there are many things that we can customize about the lens, which we'll get into in a moment. The lens is also very stable because it rests on the sclera and um, doesn't move on blink the way a corneal gas permanent lens or even a soft lens does. And the lens is known to be really comfortable for patients. There's a reduced lid interaction, again, because it doesn't move very much. Um, and so patients generally find a lot of comfort with wearing sclerals. They're indicated for a lot of things, but especially for those with corneal irregularities, such as our patients with keratoconus. Also, it's being more and more used for other diseases, such as ocular surface disease. It can also be used as prosthetics. And more and more, they're being used for healthy corneas, uh, but especially those with high uh, amitropias, really high sill, um, and certain lifestyle indications. As you can see here, Tom Cruise hanging off the side of a plane for uh, a Mission Impossible movie. <laughs> was, so I guess you could consider this a lifestyle choice if you so wish to hang on to planes and wish to keep your eyes open so you don't look like your eyes are closed during filming, then you could consider a square lens. Um, so there's a lot of indications for sclerals, but of course today our focus will be on sclerals and their use for keratoconus. So when do you choose to fit a scleral? Um, certainly this may be a philosophical question. We here at the Southern California College of Optometry really do like to reserve fitting sclerals when uh, our options are exhausted uh, for many reasons. Um, which we'll get into in a moment. But one way to determine whether or not we can fit a scleral or if we need to fit a scleral is if we feel that a corneal gas permeral lens will not be supported. Uh, you may have watched a webinar from Drs. Lam and Dr. Cho and Dr. Chang and Dr. Lam, which if you haven't, I highly recommend, um, that will likely have talked to you about corneal gas permeral lenses for keratoconus. So really we like to fit those first 
um, for health reasons and a number of myriad of other reasons. But there is a time where unfortunately the keratoconus may be so irregular and the ocular surface so irregular that it will not support a corneal gas permeal lens. And so that brings me to cite a study that was done uh, by Dr. Zhang at Pacific where they basically reviewed their charts and looked at patients that were uh, keratoconic and whether they were successful um, or not in a corneal gas permeal lenses. Um, I think they also studied the irregular corneas too. Um, and uh, they basically found that patients that had 350 microns or less of corneal elevation differences using their elevation maps of topography had an 88.2% chance of success with the corneal GP lens. So basically that translates that if a patient has 350 microns or greater of elevation difference between the high and the low point of their eye, then there's a 22% chance that they need to be in a scleral. So that may be one way that you determine that, hey, you know what, uh, this patient's just not working out and they need to be put into a scleral ultimately. Um, sometimes it may be a comfort issue. The patient is intolerant to a corneal gas permeable lens and you may need to move into a scleral. But in general, again, we really reserve our scleral lens fitting for patients that have exhausted the rest of their options. They, they can't be in a corneal gas permeable lens, perhaps piggybacking a corneal gas permeable lens doesn't work. And ultimately we decide, okay, we need to move this patient into a scleral lens. Scleral lenses, um, there are multiple labs that make them and they might have kind of different names for the designs and different names for the different zones. However, you, you could more or less divide them into three um, main areas within a scleral gas permeable lens. And one is the optic zone, which is uh, what's gonna hopefully be vaulting the cornea. Then the second will be the transitional zone, which is a change in the curvature of the lens so that it can land appropriately on the sclera. And then finally, the landing zone, also known as the haptic zone, where the lens lands. So you as a clinician will be altering and changing each of these curves to best vault over the cornea in the most even way possible. And then, um, changing that transition zone to have the appropriate clearance. And finally, changing the haptic or landing zone to best fit the patient's sclera and make sure that it is a healthy fit for the patient. So there's multiple curves at play when you are ultimately designing and changing lenses for a patient in a scleral. There are some basic fitting guidelines that we're gonna move through in just a moment here. But the ultimate goal for you as a clinician is to fit the patient in an ideal way to optimize cornea physiology, to balance the patient, to have good comfort and vision, of course, and ultimately we wanna maintain ocular health. Now, the caveat I alluded to about scleral lenses earlier was that right now we don't have a, a great history or uh, literature to tell us what the long-term effects are on anterior corneal health with scleral lenses. So scleral lenses have sort of had a resurgence now that we have higher DK materials and more oxygen permanent materials in the last 10 to 15 years. However, we don't know long-term what the problems may be for patients that wear this for their lifetime. And so again, that is another reason why we try our best to optimize health. And again, another reason why we like to reserve scleral lens fitting for those that um, really have exhausted other options, because we just don't know long-term what the potential problems may be with scleral lens wear. Now, I'm gonna move forward now and talk about what we're ideally looking for in a scleral lens fit. And one thing that we're looking for is the central clearance or the amount of tear film that's left between the cornea and the lens itself. These uh, university uh, photos from Ferris State University are very nice and you can also Google them for yourself. Um, and here in this photo here on the very left-hand side, you can see sort of this zone A, this is the thickness of the contact lens. This B zone in green, that's the fluorescein filling the tear lens. And finally, the cornea behind it. Now, in this representation photo, there's a nice even tear layer here. And in all these photos, actually, there's a nice even tear layer. But one thing to keep in mind for scleral lens fitting for keratoconic patients, especially, is that that cornea will not be um, even and uniform. There's likely gonna be an area of ectasia, and there's gonna be areas where there's probably uh, less 
tier clearance and areas where there's more tier clearance. So it's going to be important for fitting these keratoconic patients to know, okay, what is the clearance over, um, you know, the thinnest spot, perhaps over the area of the mosatasia? What's the area, you know, adjacent to that, or where's the max amount of clearance? When you are judging clearance, we advise that you compare the amount of tear layer compared to the amount of thickness of the lens itself. The thickness of the lens itself is a known value. It either came on the lab invoice or you could take a caliper and measure it yourself, especially in a, a person who's a keratoconic patient. Again, the cornea is going to be irregular. You're not going to know the exact uh, thickness of the cornea and it's going to range in how thick it is. So comparing the tear layer to the cornea thickness is not going to be ideal because it's going to be an unknown and variable value. So again, uh, we would advise compare this zone B, the tear clearance, to zone A, which is the center thickness of the lens. Now, if you can, you'd fill the lens bowl with fluorescein before applying the lens to the patient's eye. So you can tell, again, what that tear clearance is. But we could also see this with white light if, in case, I guess, you turned, imagine this is a black and white photo. If the light was traveling left to right, this first light beam here is the surface of the lens. The second light beam is the back surface of the lens. Therefore, you know that this other hazy area, that's gotta be the cornea. So you can tell by inference where the tear layer is and where the center thickness or the thickness of the lens is. And you can compare with or without fluorescein, but of course with fluorescein, it's going to really highlight the um, areas for you and make it a lot easier to see. One pro tip I'll warn you about though, is if you are using fluorescein and you happen to get a little bit of front surface fluorescein, as you can see here, it's lighting up green. Don't let that confuse you to make you think that the front surface is the tear layer. Um, that's just the tears on the front surface of the lens. Now, this photo shows representations of uh, more and less clearance, all the way here, 600 microns of clearance, all the way here, 50 microns of clearance. We'll get into what is ideal later on in the slides here, but again, you're just gonna be comparing, hey, how, how many uh, center thicknesses of these lenses can I fit into this tear layer here? And that's one way that you can, again, uh, figure out what the central clearance is. Now, here are those general guidelines that I was um, alluding to as far as what you ideally would like to see for the amount of tear clearance. Now, one might think, well, all I got to do is just make sure I clear that cone and I could just, you know, have a ton of clearance there. And while that may be something that you'd like to do, um, it's not what would be ideal from the physiological sense, because the thicker the tear layer is, the less oxygen transmissibility there is because the thickness of the tear layer prevents oxygen from uh, permeating all the way to the cornea. So for these reasons, we uh, recommend that ultimately after the lens settle, settles, that there should only be 50 to 250 microns of tear layer thickness after the lens has fully settled down. Now, before that, when you initially put the lens on, um, you're looking for ideally 200 to 300 microns of clearance initially. And oftentimes, most lenses are about 300 to 350 microns of thickness. So um, in general, you're probably looking for there to be about a one-to-one -one relationship when you first put the lens on, meaning the thickness of the lens compared to the thickness of the tear layer should about be equal. And then over time, as the patient wears the lens, um, it should naturally settle 100 to, 150 to 200 microns and help, hopefully you'll land in this 50 to 250 micron settling after the patient wears the lens. Um, there is a high variability in settling depending on the patient. Um, and about 70% of the settling occurs in the first two hours of wear. However, I will say clinically speaking, if you're fitting a patient brand new into a scleral lens, they've never worn a scleral lens before, I find that there's additional settling of the conjunctiva as, as well. The conj and the sclera where the lens lands on is squishy. And over time, I found that additional settling will occur. So ideally, when you're fitting the scleral, you're going to bring the patient back multiple times. And ideally, the patient will wear the lenses for prolonged periods of time before uh, you evaluate and, again, take a look at the ultimate settling. Now, 50 microns may seem a bit thin, but Again, that may be the optimal way to make sure the patient gets oxygen. Now, my fitting philosophy personally will vary a little bit depending on 
the patient's severity of keratoconus and the stage of keratoconus. Um, and the question I really ask myself is, hey, does this patient stable or is there a strong likelihood that they're going to continue to progress? And if the patient is young and, you know, in their 20s and 30s, and I've seen progression from year to year, I'm likely going to err on the higher side of clearance when settled because I want to make sure there's no chance that the cornea is going to change and ultimately touch the lens unbeknownst to myself and the patient before I see them again for their annual follow-up. If the patient, however, is extremely stable and I don't predict that there's going to be a change and there's more ectasia down the pipeline for this patient, then I will try to err on the side of thinner clearance to maximize the oxygen and maximize um, health for the patient as well. So your fitting philosophy may change a little bit depending on the patient's state and, and how severe the keratoconus is and ultimately how progressive the keratoconus is. In addition to checking the central clearance, and again, especially in a keratoconic patient, the area uh, over the area of ectasia, we check the mid peripheral clearance and, uh, and ultimately we check the limbal clearance. And the limbal clearance is especially important because um, from our anatomy days, we got to remember that the limbus houses the stem cells of the cornea. And we want to, again, especially make sure that this area is taken care of and there's maximum amount of oxygen and no rubbing uh, in this area. So you're ideally looking for about 100 microns upon application of the lens and hopefully 50 microns of, of, of tear layer post settling. Now, as you can see here in these photos, and they can be very thin and very difficult to judge and to see. You're gonna move your light tower and your optic section all the way out to the limbus, kind of similar to what you would do for a Van Herrick angle, and try to judge the thickness of the clearance over that limbal area compared to the thickness of the cornea, um, of the corneal scleral lens, excuse me, of just the scleral lens. Um, this can be really difficult to see, and especially can be very difficult without fluorescein. If you're lucky enough, you may be able to use an OCT to better get a gauge and, and measure the thickness of this area. You could also use the OCT to judge central clearance as well, if that's something that's uh, available to your fingertips. Usually, however, center thickness can be relatively easy to judge, but limbal clearance, because it's so dang thin, can be very difficult. So again, if you're really unsure, you can employ a, a OCT and you can see, yep, yeah, in this picture, there's a teeny tiny bit of limbal clearance and you could usually use a caliper or a measurement tool and most OCT um, softwares that will help you measure the exact amount of microns of clearance here. Clinically speaking, I would say for me, if I didn't have access to an OCT and I believe there's clearance there, but it's very thin, the ultimate test for me will be when I remove the lens and check for corneal and limbal staining. If I see limbal staining, then I know for sure, unfortunately it had touch there and I didn't have enough limbal clearance. Alternatively, if there is an excessive clearance in this area, there may be a negative um, staining and what we call limbal bogging, where there may be kind of an excessive amount of clearance and there's a little bit of swelling in the cornea in this area. So those are some clinical ways to check if you don't have access to an OCT. Now, looking at these photos here side by side, you can also get an inkling in this particular photo that there's very limited to no limbal clearance because you can see how much fluorescein there is underneath this lens here centrally. And as you move out toward the limbus, it thins and gets really dark here. Um, and so, yeah, you had a, 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 a good thought that likely there was going to be very limited to no limbal clearance. On the other side here, you can see that there is fluorescein that moves all the way through the central cornea, all the way toward the limbus and even beyond the limbus, so that in all likelihood there was limbal clearance here. Now the question is, again, if there's too much limbal clearance, but that's something, again, you could use optic section and OCT to help you with. Ultimately, we want the lenses to land appropriately on the sclera, and the term that we use for this is called scleral alignment. And if we say that the lens is properly sclerally aligned, this is a good thing, meaning that the landing zone landing on the sclera itself is not impinging or putting too much pressure in any particular spot. The weight of the lens is evenly distributed. And that therefore what we look for is can blood vessels move freely back and forth from underneath the edge of the lens towards the limbus or not? 
if you look at this bottom photo here, you can see there's some areas of whitening. And for example, here, a major vessel is able to pass through, but you can see all this congestion here where there's um, no vessels that are able to pass through. And all of a sudden there's a sort of a rebound uh, filling of the vessels over here on the other side. So you can see throughout, throughout this edge of the lens here that there's a lot of um, pressing and pressure right on the edge of the lens, preventing major vessels, uh, all the minor vessels and some of the major vessels even here from even being able to pass through. So again, the goal is that the landing zone should rest evenly on the sclera without any compression of blood vessels. And at the same time, you also don't want it to land so flat that there's edge lift because that would be very uncomfortable for the patient. And more than discomfort for the patient, edge lift as seen here in this um, edge relationship photo can also introduce bubbles and debris that can enter the chamber and make the lens wear um, annoying for the patient as well. So definitely you don't want severe edge lift. On the same time, you definitely don't want severe impingement or pressing here. A lot of this is uh, what I like to say a Goldilocks game of trying to find it just right in between um, where ideally you will have good edge alignment all the way 360 degrees. I will say that uh, you know mild impingement and maybe a few clock hours can potentially be tolerable for a patient. Obviously, it's not ideal, but sometimes it's difficult to, difficult to achieve 360 good alignment all the way around. Um, certainly, we don't want to finalize a lens that has severe impingement, um, and we don't want to finalize a lens that has severe lift either. Again, we're looking for good alignment all the way around, and unfortunately, this is what I find to be one of the most personally difficult parts about scleral lens fitting, you know, vaulting over an irregular cornea, vaulting over the ectasia of keratoconus is, in my opinion, easier than often finding a lens that will land appropriately because the sclera itself is torque and asymmetric. And so the further and further away you get from the limbus to, you know, the outer sclera, so to speak, it becomes even more torque and even more asymmetric. And oftentimes with a patient with an irregular cornea like keratoconus, if it's severe, then we are often forced to need a larger diameter scleral lens in order to get enough scleral, uh, excuse me, get enough vault and get enough clearance to clear the areas of ectasia. And so we'll run into the problem where again, the sclera is torque and asymmetric. Um, you know, in general, that it tends to be that the scleral elevation is higher nasally, lower temporally. Um, and in general, because of this reason and the weight of the lens, it tends to be that the scleral lens will tend to end up falling and fitting inferior temporal for the patient. This can also cause some mild issues where the clearance centrally will be um, asymmetric as the lens pushes out temporal and inferior. Um, there could be more thin clearance here on the nasal side. So certainly something to watch for. Now we do have some tools in our tool chest in order to help get the lens centered and to align properly. And nowadays, most of the time, I'm fitting a patient with a torque back surface lens. So this isn't a torque front surface, it's a torque back surface. So the landing in the back of the lens will have a torque haptic where in one meridian, it could be flatter, and in another meridian, it can be steeper by comparison in order to align to our torque in asymmetric scleras. You can, of course, fit a patient with a scleral um, lens with a spherical back surface. However, I would say that I have not fit one of those in a very, very, very long time um, because it just tends to be that most patients have a torque uh, sclera. One really cool and new-ish thing that is around that can help us is now there are quadrant-specific uh, landings for sclerals from certain manufacturers. So if you find that um, you know it's not just meridional, um, that the um, asymmetry is quadrantal, then you can certainly employ a quadrant-specific back surface torque lens as well. Because we are landing on the sclera, there can be speed bumps in the way that will impede on our ability to land properly. One of which that's just common is a pimbecula or pterygia. And one thing we can do is we can notch the lens. You can see that there's kind of a cookie cutter out of this lens to avoid the area. And now many, many manufacturers uh, are having the technology to create a localized peripheral vault. Uh, you might hear something like a mini vault, a uh, micro vault, where you can specify on the edge of the lens how many um, you know, millimeters in, 
how big of an area and how much sagittal depth that you'd like, often again, very useful for pinguecula and pterygia. Um, and so there's edge modifications you can make. Again, you could try a quadrantral design of the lens if there's you know different quadrants that you need to avoid different things. But ultimately, again, we wanna try to avoid impingement and conjunctive elevations such as filtering blebs. And sometimes that may mean that you choose a diameter of a lens that specifically avoids um, those areas as well. All right, so now that we've kind of gone through what we're looking for for an ideal fit, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Catherine Zhang, who's gonna to talk to us about complications of scleral lens fitting and move through a case as well. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for that great explanation of scleral lens fitting, and Dr. Ru for that introduction. Um, I'm Dr. Zhang, and I'm gonna start and talk about a couple of complications that can occur with scleral lens wear. And as we know, with contact lens wear, any contact lens wear, there are risks or complications that can occur. So we'll go over some of that today, as well as some of the ways to modify and avoid those complications. So one of the most discussed complications with sclerals in particular is the risk of hypoxia. And that's due to the fact that the transmissibility of oxygen through the sclerals may be lower compared to other modalities. So studies have showed, including a study that our very own Dr. Chen took a part in as well, showed substantially less tear exchange with sclerals compared to that such as of soft lenses. So even if clinical corneal edema isn't seen on the slit lamp exam or not revealed, some subclinical levels of swelling may occur. So some studies have showed up to 3% during scleral lens wears. So this is important because some complications from hypoxia include edema, limbal injection, you might get microcysts or boule, um, neovascularization, and sometimes it can also affect the endothelium of the cornea with polymechanism and pleomorphism. So that being said, Another tool that's helpful to use before fitting or throughout the fitting process and follow-up is specular microscopy. What this is, it helps take a baseline um, or takes an image of the endothelial. And what we look for is the cell count. So the lowest recommended endothelial cell count for scleral lens wear is around 800 to 1,000 cells per millimeter square. Some other things to look at include just looking at the shape of the endothelium. If you see this picture on the right-hand side, you can see this patient's endothelium is a bit irregular. So those are all things to take into consideration to see if their endothelium is healthy enough to maintain sterile lens wear without leading into complications like edema and swelling. So what are some ways to fit to reduce hypoxia? So like Dr. Chen mentioned, the minimal re reasonable center clearance that, um, that should be achieved should be around less than 200. Of course, it depends on the individual patient. So every patient's different um, and every patient may need a different amount, but this is a general guideline to kind of fit closer to the cornea around 100 to 250 microns practically to en enable um, as much oxygen as possible to get to the eye. Another recommendation is to use a high decay material. So this is the oxygen permeability in the material of the lens. So now we have materials that can go up to 200 decay. So picking a hyper decay material is also important. Another way is to also pick a lens with a minimal lens center thickness. And if you know the thinner a lens gets, it can also cause flexure, which we can talk about later. But around less than 260 microns of the center thickness of the actual lens is also recommended. And if you can facilitate tear exchange with the scleral, that kind of changes the game a bit. This can be done by properly aligning the landing zone with torque haptics. Uh, you can also, some companies are now offering fenestrations and channels, and this also helps to release into the globe and can help promote tear exchange. So in this photo, you can see on the purple corner of the scleral lens, there's a little small hole or fenestration in this lens. Midday fogging is also another very common complication that can happen with scleral lens wear. The causes of this complication are often multifactorial, and it also can occur in 33% of scleral lens wearers, especially with those with a predisposition for dry eye. Some causes of this complication include excessive clearance, with one study showing that clearance exceeding 500 microns may cause midday fogging. But we have also seen uh, many times midday fogging occurring with less clearances as well. 
Also, poor edge design, such as if the edges are too loose, it can cause too much exchange of debris. Also, some of the etiologies of why this phenomenon even occurs includes that patients may have um, patients with a predisposition for this complication may have higher lipid concentrations in their ocular surface. Also, they have linked it to faster corneal epithelial, which may be related to poor or incompatible solutions. It can also be a response to increased hypoxia and inflammation. So how do we reduce midday fogging? So part of it is trying to achieve the optimal fit. So reducing the central clearance if it's excessive, uh, reducing limbal clearance. So how this helps is that it will help decrease the negative pressure, which is responsible for the debris influx behind the lens, and also by optimizing the edge alignment. You can also use a more viscous solution in the bowl of the lens. We always recommend having a patient you fill the lens with a non-preserved saline, but sometimes you can mix in something, a non-preserved viscous solution like Saluvisc into the bowl of the lens. And sometimes even with all this, you may need to educate your patient that they just may need to remove and refresh the lens midday when it gets too foggy to see. On a similar note, front surface deposits or for poor wettability is also a very common complication that may occur with scleral lens wear. In fact, at a survey taken at GSLS in 2017, 90.8% of practitioners documented this for wedding to occur. So this was the top minor scleral complication that they um, surveyed and saw that practitioners experienced. So how do we get rid of poor wedding? So the first thing also is to determine, as we mentioned before, is the source of the patient's symptoms from poor wedding or from fogging. The symptoms can appear very similar, but as we talked about in the last slide, fogging happens behind the lens surface and poor wetting happens on the F1 surface. So determining which is the cause of the symptoms will help you with the management as the, as the management may be different. It is also imperative to treat and manage any ocular surface disease. So oftentimes two scleral lenses are used for therapeutic purposes in patients with ocular surface disease. So it's imperative to try to treat that baseline first as well in order to prevent uh, these complications from continuing to occur or persisting. This is one, um, educating patients about proper lens handling is actually something that I often see as the cause of poor wetting. Uh, and this is including asking patients about hand soaps or face creams and eye creams. If they're using soaps or products that are very oily and have moisturizer base that might leave a residue on the front of the lens and that will make the tears unable to coat it properly. Another thing is to educate the patient on the proper cleaning habits. With scleral lenses, there are many solutions that they'll have to use, a cleaning solution, a filling solution, um, and making sure they're using the proper ones will also help with the integrity of the visual quality in terms of wetting and fogging. So to educate the patients and to also remind them to avoid abrasive cleaners that might damage the integrity of the lens quality itself. You can also choose to do things like consider tangible hydropeg, which is a coating you can order um, to help with the lens wetting, and also consider different lens materials. So there are some materials that have a lower wetting angle, which helps with the, with the poor wetting. Um, but also, I, in my experience, I've just seen patients work better in different materials um, in general. And lastly, similar to the fogging is just to manage, even with all of this, you may need to just still manage expectations for the patient. Sometimes you still need to re reapply the lens throughout the day and implement something called the squeegee method is where you just use either the side of a plunger or a Q-tip with some solution on it to literally squeegee the front of the lens to get them a little bit longer fusible vision. Corneal staining is another complication that can occur and which should be checked at every follow-up. So at every follow-up, we always look at the ocular health, we always stain to make sure there's no negative adverse effects with the lens wear. And you can categorize these two into two um, different groups. So one being localized, which can include mechanical, so areas of bearing or areas of excessive clearance, or even if you have a patient insert of the lens with a bubble that can cause desiccation under the bubble and localized staining. The fused staining may indicate a hypoxic response or a toxic response to wrong solutions or incompatible solution used. 
And treatment for these corneal stainings would be to remove whatever the insulting factor is causing the staining. Conjunctival prolapse is another complication that could happen with scleral. It's more specific to scleral lens wear. So what that is, is the entrapment of conjunctiva underneath the scleral lens with the common, most common quadrant being inferiorly. If the tissue retrocedes, if it goes away back to normal after lens removal, uh, most practitioners will tend to just mo monitor and it may be benign. However, um, that being said, the potential for long-term negative outcome with conjunctival prolapse is still quite unknown. Uh, what is known to you if, if the tissue remains adherent, so if you take the lens off and the, the conjunctiva is still stuck on that area of the cornea, you're unable to manipulate it, there is some concern because the tissue that covers that limbal area um, will cover the stem cells and may provoke neo. So some of the ways to manage this is to limit limbal clearance. As we mentioned previously, excessive limbal clearance can cause that negative suction to suck up debris, but also perhaps conjunctiva. Also to select a smaller diameter, uh, to steepen any loose edges, and also to review lens handling to make sure the patient's not putting on the lens too aggressively, um, causing that conjunctiva to get stuck under the lens. Lastly, even with the scleral, your patient may experience poor vision. Um, one of the reasons this may be is due to uncorrected cylinders. So if you have a spherical scleral lens on the cornea, they may still have some residual astigmatism that isn't corrected. So Dr. Chen mentioned the back surface toric, but you can also add a front surface toric, which corrects for the refractive error. Um, one other reason why you might have flexure is, or may have poor vision is due to flexure. And this is due to um, the lens actually reflecting on the eye and inducing some artificial astigmatism. So one way you can determine if it's really uncorrected cylinder or if it's due to flexure is by taking an autorefractor or topography over the lens while it's on the patient's eye and see if there's any induced astigmatism in the keratometry values. So a lens that without flexure should have spherical case or near spherical case. Um, and that with flexure will have, you'll see some differences in this between the steep and flat case. Lastly, with any irregular cornea, there may be an experience of higher, higher order aberrations that can't be masked with a conventional scleral lens. However, there are studies talk, targeting this issue, which we'll talk about in a future slide, but sometimes with sclerals, even with the best correction, best refraction, there may be some residual shadowing or distortion of the lenses due or of the vision due to higher order aberrations because of things like coma and spherical aberration that are higher in patients with keratoconus and irregular corneas. So scleral lens technology, the world um, of scleral lenses is advancing quite rapidly and it's there are some very exciting advancements that are happening um, which I feel privileged that we get to experience during this time. So the first being that we just want to mention is corneal scleral topography. So as we, as you guys heard in the other lectures with RGPs, you're familiar that using a topographer to map the cornea makes sense with RGP fitting since we're landing on the cornea. So kind of on the same note, since with sclerals we're landing on the sclera, there has been more research and more interest in understanding the scleral anatomy and scleral topography, um, as we mentioned, to understand the different nuances and the different shapes of scleras in our patients. So some ways that technology is coming out is the use of corneal scleral topographies, which maps both the cornea and the sclera. So some of the companies such as smap 3 e with Visionary Optics, Eagle Eye and Pentacam all have programs that allow you to do this. So how it works is that um, in this picture, this is the, specifically the S map. A photo is taken in three different gazes, and then the information is processed through their computer program. And you can see, I'm going to play a video here well, where you can see the type of schematic that it gives you, that you can observe both the sclera and the, and the cornea in a 3D model. Um, you do an over-refraction, and you send all that information to the lab, and the lab will send you a customized lens for your patient. So another technology on the same line is iPrim Pro. So this is uh, impression mold, such as um, this company here, which uses an actual mode in, mold in office and 3D scanning from the mold 
that information gets sent to the computer to in the lab to create a customized lens as well and that gets sent to you in your office so these technologies are great and this corneal scleral topography and also these molding technologies are great for patients with complex anatomy, including things like bleds or very torque scleras, um, conjunctival irregularities. So it, it allows this to be a very customized lens to fit the person's eye, just, just like a glove. It's a perfect match. Lastly, as we mentioned before, um, with sclerals or rigid gas permeables, um, patients with irregular corneas, higher order aberrations may still linger even after with the best correction. Um, so there have been studies done, specifically this study at University of Houston, they have been studying wavefront guided sclerals for a number of years. And um, why this is important is that even with the best correction, as we mentioned, there may be some residual aberrations left behind induced by the posterior cornea and internal optics um, that just can't be corrected with the conventional scleral lens. And specifically in patients with keratoconus, the residual higher order aberrations also still remain elevated compared to normal eyes with the best scleral lens. So like we mentioned at University of Houston, they've been studying this for a number of years and they have a lab where they've been studying waveform guided sclerals. And this is a study from them where they actually take a patient's wavefront patch, apply it to the front of the scleral lens to correct any, to correct the residual aberrations left behind. And you can see from the study that the higher order aberration is significantly reduced with the wavefront guided lens compared to the conventional scleral lens. However, this kind of technology is still not widely commercially available. However, there are some specialty labs that can design wavefront guided scleral lens, which is really exciting and interesting. Um, and it'll also be interesting to see in the future if this can become more commercially available. All right, so now we just have one case for you all just to showcase some of the troubleshooting with the scleral lens and how to work around certain fitting or ocular health complications. So this case is of a 26-year-old Caucasian male. His ocular history is significant for keratoconus as well as he had cross-linking and impacts done in the past. This patient is a professional baseball player, so you can imagine that clear, stable, and crisp vision is really, really important. Um, and for the manifest, you can see his vision, you know, it's not too bad through spectacles 2025 20, minus two and 2040, um, but with his squirrels, he definitely gets an improvement. And when this patient arrived at our clinic, he already was a habitual scleral lens wearer. So just looking at his topography, you can see that the cone is inferiorly displaced a bit. And just in our experience, we find that patients with inferiorly displaced cones or, cone or more pellucid looking topographies may be a little more complex to fit with GPs. It's a little harder to get the lenses to, to center well and also to not eject on patients with really low cones or with a pellucid shaped eye. This is an OCT cut of this patient. So you can see the intacts right there in the mid periphery and as well as the, the scleral lens on. So this first bar is the scleral lens. And he also has, if the number here says 109 microns of central clearance. However, you can see that as it goes mid peripheral, it actually ends up touching on the area right above the intact segment. So um, like we mentioned before, this may show up as a localized area of staining. And also, as we mentioned before, that with irregular corneas, uh, the central vault and the vault in general is not always perfect and uniform. So we have to kind of troubleshoot and see if we can lift that area of vault. So what we have here is actually a video of the patient's eye through the slit lamp. And it's just to help visualize where the intact segment is. And you can kind of see how anteriorly displaced uh, the intact segment is on the bottom as well. So here it is with white light. And that's the area we are trying to, um, that is currently touching and we're trying to increase the vault. So we kind of talked about already in the central clearance, but in this case, we need to increase the mid peripheral clearance. So what was done for this patient is actually to change the patient's habitual lens, which was a prolate design, into an oblate design. So I made some drawings here, so you can please disregard my, my poor drawing skills. But on the left-hand side with the green 
drawing, that is a prolate design. So one way you can increase the mid-peripheral mid clearance is to change the design into an oblate design shown in orange. So the orange here, you can see it's flatter in the middle and the mid-periphery gives you a little bit more clearance. Another way to do that is to also flatten the base curve. So if we go back to the left side, the blue line here shows if you had um, a flatter base curve that also increases the mid peripheral clearance. So this patient, what was ordered, there's a lot of numbers here, but you can just pay attention that an oblate design was ordered. Um, also, the base curves are a little bit flatter than normal. And he saw 2015 through, through these lenses. So here we have the new lens that was ordered. You can see there's quite ample clearance over the in-text now. And this is pre-settling. So over time, we, we expect it to settle to an appropriate amount and to not be touching. But of course, we're as we follow these patients, we're going to monitor for any changes and to make sure their ocular health is still stable. OK, so thank you so much. That was the end of our lecture, and we hope this was a helpful introduction to fitting several lenses and identifying and managing some of the complications. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much, doctors uh, Zhang and Chen. I have one question for you guys. Um, you talked about lots of different lenses. If you are a new doctor trying to figure out what scleral lenses to choose in your practice, how would you go about choosing um, a lab to work with or a brand to work with, just generally? So this is Dr. Zhang. Um, for me, during residency, I had the privilege of working with a lot of different sterile lens brands. So I kind of found some favorites. Um, for, as we mentioned, we use Zen Lens a lot. I think they were a great company um, to fit a lot of different uh, types of corneas and um, so that's one of the ones that I use and just working with the consultants you can kind of see um, what types of consultants and uh, companies work best for you and your practice in terms of what patients you see so for my all-around go-to I, I like Zen Lens as well and then I have certain brands such as like OneFit or Europa that I'll also use for more complex corneas or more specific types of corneas. Hi, this is Dr. Chen, um, and I'll just kind of piggyback off of what Dr. Zhang said. Um, what I what I do really look for, especially if we're starting out, is um, a fit set that provides both a prolate and oblate design. Because you might think, hey, this patient used a prolate design, but you put one on, you're like, oh, never mind. I think they need oblate or vice versa. And I think that is one really nice thing. Dr. Zhang mentioned the Zen Lens fit set, and that's, I think, a really great point about the Zen Lens fit set, that within one fitting set, there's not only prolate and oblate design, but there's also two different diameters. So, I mean, if you just have to pick one, um, fit sets do cost money. <laughs> and so um, you might want to look for a fit set that gives you multiple options. Um, some labs will offer just a prolate set or just an oblate set and you need to buy one or the other and they may offer a fit set that with a specific diameter only. So what I would be looking for myself is a, a fit set that has um, multiple options within a single fit set. And of course, the other thing too is I think all lab um, consultants are really nice. You just kind of see who uh, you work better with and um, who you, you enjoy working with. That might be another parameter that you might... Um, think about. And more than that, I think what I would think about is the warranty that the pay, uh, that the lab offers, you know, how many redos you get for how much. Um, and then another, I guess, real issue is uh, being in, able to work with them, being in the right time zone. You know, for example, if you're on the West Coast and you deal with a lab on the East Coast, you might be kind of playing phone tag all the time if your hours don't align. Um, also, if you have a lab that's really far away from you, that also means that shipping time can be a little longer. So turnaround time back and forth between the lenses uh, may take longer. So there's also sort of a geographical consideration as well as a warranty consideration um, that I would think about as well. Awesome. Those are really, really good points. Um, well, thank you both for presenting uh, for, for this series. And I, I think that wraps it up for this session.